Oh, let's see. Just got a breaking news text message. Not breaking news enough. I'm on stage, baby. <laughs> Ohio, what is good? Thank you so much for coming to my live show here at this dance hall slash bowling alley slash restaurant bar. I've had a great time. If you can tell that the vibes are right, it's because uh, me and my guest before the show began played some, uh, I played some bowling. Uh, <laughs> what do you even say? We, we did some bowling, we shot some lanes, we knocked some pins. I have no idea how to bowl. I hit triple digits, so I'm feeling amazing. I'm on cloud 11, because I got one third of the maximum score. <laughs> feeling good. And then also, in the green room, they have NBA Jam. I'm having the time of my life. We're gonna have a great show. If that shows how much I am happy to do the show and how much I have love for all of you all because to take me away from a functioning NBA Jam machine <laughs> on free play mode? <laughs> ha! Huh. But we have very many important things to discuss today and in this first act we are going to be covering a very spicy chapter and a half of the fifth book of the Percy Jackson series. So please welcome to our stage our guest because I can never cover this stuff alone. We are here joined by Cleveland's own Eric Hamilton Schneider. Make some noise. <laughs> Thank you for carrying all my oh things. My <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank you, thank I you. I was like, don't drop the laptop. I appreciate And also that. carry drinks. <laughs> <laughs> Hello. I was just here two weeks ago for a show, and now I'm here for a different kind of show. The best was when my touring guy was telling me of the places where I was going on this leg of the tour. I messaged you, I was like, hey, have you ever been to this place, Mahal's in Cleveland? You were like, that place rules. It has a bowling alley in it. And I was like, yes. Yeah. It's an unspecified number of blocks away from my house. Yeah, because you live in <laughs> undisclosed location, Cleveland. Yeah. But yes, I'm very excited to be here. This is my first time ever in the land, so it is. <laughs> It is a delight to be here, and I'm especially excited to be here because since I moved into New York years back, anytime I'm driving into New York, there's all these billboards, and I've texted you about mm -hmm, them, but there's mm -hmm, all these billboards yeah. that when you're like going into New York from New Jersey, it's like, Ohio's better than New York. <laughs> you should just move to Ohio. And they got like really prolific during like pandemic, COVID, work from home stuff, and it would be things like, Ohio, our income tax is like non-existent, or like, Ohio, it's like super cheap and stuff. And there were all these different ones, and I was waiting for one to be like, Ohio, you can kill a guy, just one, but it's okay. <laughs> We'll look over it. <laughs> I mean, we're, we're getting there. We're getting there. <laughs> Let's not get into whatever Ohio politics are, which I'm sure is super cool and normal and fun. Let's talk about <laughs> Percy Jackson and the Olympians, which is actually very cool and fun. It I'm is. a big fan of it. Now, I always ask guests, and this is your first time being on the show, which mm -hmm. is exciting. Yeah. What is your history with the Percy Jackson books? Yeah, so like three months ago, you're like, hey, I'm doing a show at Cleveland. <laughs> and I was like, I should probably read those books, right? And so I've read all of the books up until what we're covering today in the last 45 days. Yes. And I like them. They're a lot of fun. They're yeah. a lot of fun, real good stuff. It was nice to basically every four or five days get a text message from you that was like, book one's awesome. Yeah. And then six days ago, I'd be like, book two is really good. <laughs> They're good. They get better. They yeah. keep getting better. They do keep getting better. And this book slaps. And what you're going to be doing, because you'll also be the guest for the Detroit show, is in between this show and the next show, you'll finish the fifth the book. The whole thing. So in you'll two days. Currently, you are a newbie. And then yes, come an next episode, you'll be world-renowned Percy Jackson expert, Eric Hamilton yep. Schneider. Yep. <laughs> but we'll be covering chapter 11 and about half of chapter 12. Chapter 11 is called We Break a Bridge. Now, my guess here, because I always try to guess what happens in the chapters mm. before I read them. My guess was that they break a bridge. <laughs> yeah. Feels like that's where I was at. Is yeah. that a... a lot of them are more mysterious chapter titles. Yes. This one, not so much. This not one's so like, much. hey, we're in New York, lots of bridges. One's going to break. 
There are many bridges. Yeah. They made a whole movie about how many bridges there are. And that's true. That's true. 13? I think it's it's 22 because I referenced it better. in an episode yeah. and yeah. I said 21, which is not the right answer. Yeah. There's 22 bridges. That's, I'm so sorry blackjack. to the city of New York State. I'm sorry. I said that's Blackjack, who's in this book. Yes. Well done. <laughs> Nailed it. <laughs> For a second, I was like, Blackjack? What are you talking about? Chadwick Boseman's in that movie. <laughs> <laughs> It's all right. We're doing great. Now, where we last left our heroes, we had Percy getting ready to square up with the Minotaur for round two, Electric Boogaloo. Narrative Percy starts this chapter with wonderful words that I love to hear. Quote, fortunately, Blackjack was on duty. I was very, very excited about this. I am always very excited when Blackjack comes around. Are you a Blackjack fan or not? Yeah. Okay. I like that this Pegasus has like an attitude to him. I like his his logical thing, which I think we're about to talk about, is Percy asks him in this chapter about, like, why they gallop in the air. And he's like, why do humans swing their arms? I was like, that's a good point. It's that's good. That's a good point. He's got a good head on his shoulders. Do horses have shoulders? Sure. Yeah, sure. So Percy does a taxi whistle, and two pegasi appear. It's Blackjack and Pork Pie. Blackjack says, yo, boss, man, I thought those wind gods were going to knock us to Pennsylvania until we said we were with you, which is good, especially because out of context here, we were talking about how certain parts of Pennsylvania, not ideal. Not ideal. Not ideal, but it's okay. We're here in Ohio, the good part of the Midwest. Woo! <laughs> Pennsylvania's turned off the podcast now. <laughs> <laughs> This is the point that you're just talking about. Percy thanks them for showing up and asks why they gallop when they fly away. I love Percy just unprompted asking this question. War. <laughs> War is happening. <laughs> End times are about to begin. And he's like, hey, why do you guys gallop in the air? Now is the time this pops in his head? I do not have ADHD, and I do not mean to speak on behalf of people who do, yeah. but my guess would be that this is an ADHD thing. Makes sense. Makes okay, sense. some yeses from the audience of like, yeah, sure, the world's ending, but I do have a very important question. <laughs> Just feels like it would have come up sooner. <laughs> yeah. Percy thanks him, asks this question, and Blackjack retorts, why do humans, sorry, no, he doesn't say it that way. He says, why do you humans swing their arms as they walk? I don't know, boss. It feels right. Where to? I hope Blackjack never changes. I love this. I love this. And I got to think that Uncle Rick just must have a blast. It must be so fun. I'm not a writer like this in any means, but it must be fun to write a character that's so goofy that you just get to be like, ah, yes, I will make sure this character's in the scene now. And now I get to decide what is being said. It's got to be a blast for him. So Percy says he needs to go to the Williamsburg Bridge. Blackjack says, you're darn right, boss. We flew over it on the way here, and it don't look good. Hop on! <laughs> and Percy's nervous on the flight over about the Minotaur, and I don't think he has to necessarily be worried because he beat him mm -hmm. in book one when he knew nothing, like yeah. literally nothing about all this Greek stuff, and he defeated the Minotaur. I feel like... Percy should be able to defeat him again, not only now that he has all this knowledge, but he's also invincible. I feel mm -hmm. like it's not going to be that tough of a fight. Yeah, it seems pretty straightforward. I mean, he knew, like, he had basically no understanding when he defeats him on the hill, right? Mm -hmm. Does he even know that his sword is a sword at that point? Like, kind of. I don't think he has a sword at that point. All he does is, like, ride on the Minotaur and then break his horn oh, off yeah, and then he dissolves. Right. Yeah. So I don't think he knew anything. Yeah. I think he's going to be totally fine. I'm not worried. But Percy is worried. As they approach the bridge, Percy sees that there are loads of fires across it. Now, my autocorrect here said loads of fries across it. That would be way more fun. But there's a bunch of fires on the bridge. There are also Apollo campers who are actively retreating. There are Dracani and Hellhounds advancing. Annabeth then points out the Minotaur, which Percy calls Old Beefhead himself, mm -hmm. which is great. Now, Percy says that the last time, the Minotaur was only wearing tidy whities and he didn't know why, and I still don't know why. Yeah. I don't know if I've asked that explicitly to any of our mythological correspondents in the myth episodes, but I feel like I need to see if that was a thing. I feel like I asked Dr. Moy that, and she was like, I don't know. Yeah. Might just be a vibe thing. But at this point, he is now not clad in tidy whities He's wearing full-on battle armor, and you would know this because you are a fellow player of Hades, a video game, but I imagine him in Asterius's full, like, golden oh, yeah. armor when you put yeah. on Extreme Measures 3 or above. I've never done Extreme Measures 3. Really? No. Oh, it's not that bad. 
I know it's not that bad, but I saw it one time and I was like, they gave the other guy a Gatling gun. I was like, I don't need that in my life. The upgrade, yeah, yeah he's like in a chariot and he's got like a gun and stuff, yeah. but honestly, it's not that hard. It's only I three know, heat wins. Look, we can get in the weeds and I can give Hades strategies, yeah. but You're all this much is better at Hades than I am. Thank you for the compliments. You're welcome. <laughs> Anyway, back to Percy Jackson, yes, though. Yes. This is what I'm imagining. The gold yeah, armor, yeah, it's a exactly. good look. Yeah. The Minotaur sees Percy flying on Blackjack and chucks a limo at them, which is impressive. Yeah. Blackjack goes, no way could he, holy horse feed, and then has to dodge the literal limo that's headed his way. Holy horse feed, very good. Holy horse feed is pretty good. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I don't know if there was any other better horse pun that could have sounded more like a curse. None yeah. come to mind, but... Holy horse feet's pretty solid. I, I like it. Now this limo just misses them. The other monsters begin to cheer. It picks up another car. Percy instructs Blackjack to drop them with the Apollo campers and to get out of harm's way, but still within earshot in case they need Blackjack again. And he says, I ain't gonna argue, boss, and drops them behind an overturned school bus. Now, Michael Yu thanks them for joining the forces and asks where the other reinforcements are. Percy says that they are the reinforcements for now, and Michael Yu says, then we're dead. I don't like this. I don't like this lack of optimism from Michael yeah. Yu, who we met four chapters ago. I don't appreciate this. Yeah. And like, Percy's been through it over the last four years. Mm -hmm. Maybe a little faith. And Maybe have a little faith. Like, He's been through it. He's saved the world multiple times. He's also invincible now. Like, I feel like if you're going to get anyone for reinforcements, Percy Jackson, main character of the books, <laughs> is probably a good person to have on the squad. Yeah. Yeah. I'd say so. Annabeth asks if they still have the flying chariot, and Michael Yu says that he left it at Camp Half-Blood because he gave it back to Clarice. He figured that the fighting had gone on long enough and it just wasn't worth it anymore. And I gotta say, I was grumpy and disappointed with Michael Yu. This is big. I like this from him. I think that's really mature because the whole Apollo cabin versus Ares cabin thing about the chariot was so foolish. Mm -hmm. I appreciate him taking the high road. Yeah. Unfortunately, but not, not the literal high road no, because, no. Of, because of the flying chariot. <laughs> right, correct, correct. But the moral high road, but it doesn't matter because even though he gave it back to Clarice, Clarice said that it was too late and they've insulted their honor for the last time. And Percy goes, oh, at least you tried. And Michael Hugh basically says, eh, don't give me too much credit because I did call her some choice names when she said that she wouldn't help us out. So it seems like he may have soiled the good graces. Mm. Michael Yu sees the monsters approaching and he fires an arrow and his arrow is a sonic arrow that makes a loud guitar noise and disrupts the enemies by causing them to drop their weapons and cover their ears and some of them even run away. Feels pretty fitting as we're doing the show here in the place of the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. <laughs> boo. Oh, boo. <gasps> Do we not I mean, like I mean, it? I mean, just, just the pandering. Just the pandering. <laughs> that one's one step too far. When in Rome, baby. <laughs> Except when in Cleveland, baby. Except technically when in Lakewood, baby. <laughs> The monsters begin to regroup. Michael Yu says that they should retreat. And he also says that he has Kayla. We've never met Kayla before, right? I don't believe so. No. And then he also has Austin. We haven't met Austin before, right? Definitely have not met anyone <laughs> cool. in Austin. He's got Kayla and Austin, who we all love and care about so deeply. Our favorites. Our favorite people, yeah. Kayla and Austin. They are setting traps farther down the bridge. And I was wondering, oh yeah, they say they're gonna break the bridge. Maybe it's an intentional breaking of the bridge. But Percy says, no, they'll drive the enemy forces back to Brooklyn, where they belong. <laughs> I'm a big Brooklyn hater. It's well established. Mm. Michael Yu laughs and asks, how? And this is ridiculous. I believe Michael Yu also was the person who asked how in a previous chapter when Percy said that he was going to make the boats go away with the river. And he was like, how are you going to do that? I don't know. Maybe my dad's Poseidon? <laughs> but again, Michael Yu, who has just not been paying attention, asks Percy, how he's gonna do this. Percy draws his sword as an answer. Annabeth pleads with Percy to let her join him, but Percy says it's too dangerous and Michael Yu will need help organizing the defensive line anyway. He is going to distract the monsters in classic Percy Jackson fashion, and then they can get the mortals to safety and they can start picking off the monsters while Percy has them distracted. Annabeth reluctantly agrees. Percy, in the absolute least smooth move possible, says, oh. quote, mm. Don't I get a kiss for luck? It's kind of tradition, right? It's not. 
It's it happened bad. once. It happened once. It happened once. Not tradition. You got to do something, what, at least three times for tradition? <laughs> yeah. At least three. <laughs> or you at least have to be going into it, planning for it to be a tradition yeah. if it's under yeah. three. Yeah. But as unsuave as this is, I do feel like this is something that like me at age 16, probably the best I could come up with. Like, yeah. I don't know that I would have something <laughs> good. And even though it's bad and cheesy and cringe-tastic, at least he did something. Like yeah. he, over the course of these books, has just been such a chicken when it comes to the ladies. And for him to actually at least basically be like, hello, can I please have a kiss now? <laughs> like, at least he's doing something. I can't be too upset at him. Yeah. And like, he he's clearly confused still about the whole Annabeth Rachel situation. Sure. So at least he's trying something out there, seeing what works. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. He's putting himself out there, but maybe... <laughs> Maybe run a different play. Annabeth tells him to come back alive and then they'll see, which is the best response that you can do to something that cheesy. She yeah. kind of saves the moment. Percy figures that it's the best offer that he's gonna get, so he heads off. When the Minotaur sees Percy, it lets out a huge scream. And Percy replies, hey, beef boy, didn't I kill you already? Which is great. Just a great little taunt. Have they established at all how the speed in which the monsters come back like, has there been a logic to it? Because, like, four years seems quick, but also the Minotaur is the Minotaur. So, like, maybe that's part of it. I think that that's it. I think that they say that there's not an exact science to mm -hmm. it, but usually the more powerful monsters come back more quickly. Right. So I think this came up when Kelly, with an eye, disappeared and he was unsure, and then he said, mm -hmm. like, oh, scarier monsters come back quicker. So I think that that is how it's been established. Now, the Minotaur crushes Alexis in anger. I don't know why Uncle Rick hates Lexuses. But he crushes Alexis in anger. Dracani launch spears. A hellhound attacks. And Percy dodges the hellhound, but he doesn't kill it. But then he has to remind himself that not all hellhounds are Mrs. O'Leary. And this hellhound, and basically any hellhound, will kill his friends at the drop of a hat. So he figures, okay, I can't do this again. If I can attack this thing, I'm going to have to attack this thing. But I completely understand how that would be hard yeah. if you have a really nice dog and then there's an evil version. I don't know. I feel like a lot of dogs like kind of look the same. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You I got mean, two you, dogs that look very, very similar. I have two dogs that look very similar. But if there was a monstrous boss of terrier attacking me, I'd be like, it's going to take me a second to get this <laughs> logically squared ahead <laughs> in my brain. Got to separate the good boys from the bad boy. Exactly. Now, it lunges again. This time, Percy does vanquish it. Other monsters surge forward, but the Minotaur bellows, and then they stop. Percy asks if the Minotaur wants to go one-on-one, -on -one, just like old times, and the bull responds by wielding his axe and swinging it around, which I would take as a yes. Mm -hmm. It is a twin-bladed axe, and each blade is in the shape of an Omega. That rules. Those are really solid vibes for a weapon choice. Oh, is it two Omegas? I thought it was an Omega on each side, because it's it one of those like, like double-bladed axe. It was like an Omega this way, an Omega that way. And I'm, uh, uh, this and is like great the audio content this for the podcast. Audio They're gonna love it. I just, for the audio listeners, uh, I just drew something in the air. So that was yeah. very helpful for everybody. I, I was imagining it's one of those blades, like when you, you know, you kind of have the one that's like yeah. schwung, schwung. Mm. I was imagining it's like omega, schwung, omega, schwung. So you've got. <laughs> yeah. 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 Much we, like Janice's face. <laughs> we yeah, there we go. Two blades. Now, Percy guesses that the reason that that is the shape of the blades is because Omega is the last letter in the Greek alphabet, so he thinks that it's because it's the last thing his enemies would ever see. That is rad. Yeah, like, very that is good. so cool. <laughs> genuinely the like most like metaphorical idea in here. I'm like, that actually is very cool. It's really, really, really cool. Now, tied to this very long handle that it's on are loads of Camp Half-Blood necklaces. And this Leak. enrages Percy that he's got trophies of demigods that he's defeated on his axe handle. So Percy gets so angry that he figures his eyes must be glowing like the beast. Percy raises Riptide, the crowd roars for the Minotaur, but they are quickly silenced as Percy dodges the first swing from the Minotaur and then immediately slices the axe handle in half. The bull lets out a moo with a question mark. And then Percy kicks him in the face, sending him flying backwards. The Minotaur lowers his head to charge at Percy, but then Percy slices off both of his horns with Riptide. Percy picks up one of the blades of the broken axe and he runs from the oncoming charge of the Minotaur. And the Minotaur, who is now reckless with rage, speeds up thinking that Percy is fleeing. The crowd of monsters starts to cheer, thinking that they've got him beat. 
but the Minotaur falls right into Percy's trap, which is to run and then place the blade on a pole and then let the Minotaur run into it. Very, you know, Torador, mm, move yes, the yeah. red curtain away thing. And the Minotaur falls for it, just runs right into it at full speed. It sticks into him and then he looks down at the half axe protruding from his chest in shock. And then Percy says, thanks for playing. And then flips him off the bridge, which felt highly unnecessary, but very cool. I feel like it's necessary. Cause like, what if, what if the Minotaur is back and badder than ever? Get him, get him down there, get him down there in the river. Yeah, it is nice. Just one of those, like, let me just be sure he's yeah. out of there. And then as he is falling, he begins to dissolve. So all signs would point to he's not coming yeah. back. For at least four years. <laughs> For at least four years. Yeah, maybe he'll come up in the Heroes of Olympus series. We'll there just we have go. to see. Narrator Percy then says, quote, I turned toward his army. It was now roughly 199 to one. I did the natural thing. I charged them. Great. I love this. I really enjoy Percy Jackson entering his action movie hero era. Like he's John Wick now and it's great. I'm all here for it. He admits that he's not even sure how his invincibility worked in the situation, whether it was him avoiding the weapons or the weapons just bouncing off of him. But all he can remember is shredding through their armor like paper. And he does recall laughing a wild laugh once or twice that scared him as much as it did his enemies. I love this whole section. Mm -hmm. It's very short, but like the idea that he doesn't know if he's invincible in terms of like his skin is very hard or if Mm -hmm. he's just like extremely agile is such a cool way of like talking about like having the ability of Achilles and the powers of just like, I am just good at combat now Uh and no one can hurt me is such a good way of describing it without Mm -hmm. like going into explicit detail. Right. It puts into perspective like how significant the leveling up is Mm because he's already been really solid at fighting, but now he's so good that his brain can't even process it. Even when he's in fighting mode with his ADHD demigod powers, like he's usually super honed in on what's happening during fights. Like it's almost like time slows down. And even with all of that, he doesn't know what's going on. It just just really does give the impression. It's like, this dude is wrecking shop. Yeah. Now he can also tell that the Apollo campers were helping to squash any momentum with the picking off of the enemies one by one. By the end of it, there's only about 20 enemies left and they begin to retreat. Percy moves forward to push them to Brooklyn with the Apollo campers trailing. Michael Yu is very excited. Annabeth, though, tells Percy to stop because they are overextended down the bridge. Percy knows that she's right, but he wants to vanquish them all. But then he sees the 20 of them head towards a group of about 30 to 40, and I was thinking feral hogs because Mm. my brain has been broken by the internet, but it's 30 to 40 demigods, and they are atop skeletal horses. And one of them, of course, is raising a purple and black banner because apparently each little battalion of Kronos' army has to have one of the banners. I want to know, who is running the Kronos Arts and Crafts Department, Crafts Mm. with a K? Yeah. Because they're, you know, they're evil. They're putting stuff together. They're getting all the weapons. But they do have the attention of, okay, we need to make sure that we have enough purple and black banners with scythes on it, guys. And, like, you'd think if they were doing that, it would be on the boat, which is no longer around. Mm -hmm, So, like, mm -hmm. they had to, like, regroup and do all of that. (laughs) Either that or they made multiple beforehand. Like, just in case something happens to our boat banner. Yeah. We need to have one in case we cross a bridge. (laughs) Yeah. What if they don't know who we are? Yeah. Now, the lead horseman removes his helmet, and it's Kronos, which I did not see coming. I thought this was just going to be like some smaller group, but it is Kronos himself. And he's about a quarter mile away, but Percy is convinced that even though he can't really make it out, he can feel like Kronos is smiling on the other end of the bridge. Percy tells the team to pull back, the enemies charge, and I was surprised that no one made a Here Comes the Cavalry line. It just felt like it was right there. But anyway, Apollo campers launch a set of arrows that take down a good chunk of the army, but they continue to progress. Percy calls for a retreat, adding that he will hold them off. Michael Yu and the Apollo cabin begin to retreat, but Annabeth stays by Percy's side and fights, which I think is adorable. Yeah. They get surrounded by the cavalry while Kronos leisurely approaches, which is always the most intimidating thing. When you have a villain walking slowly and looking like they can't be bothered to be here, it's scary stuff. Yeah, always super spooky. Narrative Percy about this says, quote, the Titan himself advanced leisurely like he had all the time in the world. Being the Lord of time, I guess he did. Love it, absolutely love it. 
While fending off the evil demigods, Percy tries to just wound them, not kill them, because he feels bad about killing his fellow demigods. It does slow him down a bit since he's not just being Slash McGee over here, but it's important to him because he knows that a lot of these people have just fallen under Kronos' spell and they're not necessarily evil. They've just made a poor decision, so he wants to make sure he's not killing them. He does make light work of a few skeleton horses, though, so the remaining evil people dismount their skeletal horses. Annabeth and Percy are fighting shoulder to shoulder while facing opposite directions when a dark shape passes them overhead, which either means good sign or bad sign. It's either Blackjack or someone that's going to attack. There's yeah. no in between here. When Percy looks up, he sees that it is Blackjack and Pork Pie who are, quote, swooping in, kicking our enemies in the helmets and flying away like very large kamikaze pigeons. I love that a pigeon reference naturally found its way into the newest Olympian. It makes my heart very, very, very yeah, happy. As a big pigeon fan, it's good to see. It's now canonical appreciated in the books. It's fantastic. They are just about to reach the middle of the bridge when suddenly Annabeth cries out in pain. Percy turns and he sees her fall, grabbing at her arm. And Percy sees a demigod with a bloody knife standing over her. And I thought that this dude was going to be toast. I thought Percy was going to break his little I'm not going to kill a demigod's thing and just beat this dude to bits. But Percy realizes that this guy probably went after him. And based on the angle of the slash and where everyone's positions are, he can tell that this guy was about to get Percy in his weak spot in the small of his back. But Annabeth intercepted this blow with her body, which confuses Percy because no one is supposed to know about his weak spot. He hasn't told anyone what the weak spot is. So how would she have known? Which I find very interesting. And this will get brought up later in the chapter. Yep. But the other thing I was wondering is, why doesn't Percy just have that like super duper armored up? Like, shouldn't he just have like multiple layers of bronze, celestial metal on his back just so that no one can puncture it? I feel like it's a thing where it's like, he's magically weak there. The same way he uh, magically doesn't know how he's dodging or mm -hmm. like just taking blows. If someone got him there, mm -hmm. like the armor would break no yeah. matter how much tanking he put back there. Got it, got it, That's got what it. I feel like is kind of the situation because it's it's a curse. Mm. He's cursed to be weak in one tiny spot, which means anything that goes there is coming through. I think that's a good point. I think that's a good point. Now, of course, and I should have seen this coming, that this particular evil demigod is Ethan Nakamura. And I am so sick and tired of Ethan Nakamura. <laughs> Earlier on, I was like, oh, you know, Percy saved him. Maybe he could be redeemed. And then he did the thing with the lid and bringing Kronos back. And I was like, okay, like someone was going to do it anyway. And then he was in the Demigod Files and he was kind of so bad that he was, I didn't feel bad for him, but, it, you know, he was so goofy with that. And then in the beginning of this, like he's on the boat, but like now it's like, all right, I have no sympathy for this guy anymore. Like let Ethan Nakamura die. I don't care. Yeah. Don't care. No, no. He, I mean, he sucks. Yeah. He just, no, he no really good. sucks. He's had so many chances mm -hmm. and he has failed to do anything good during any of them. Yeah. <laughs> Not great. Percy hits him in the head with the hilt of Riptide so hard that it dents his helmet. Percy yells for the enemy forces to get back, saying, no one touches her. And then Kronos replies, interesting, which is chilling. When the villain doesn't wax poetic and just says one word, again, another very bad sign. Interesting is also like a very ominous thing. It's like, mm -hmm. I've learned something. Mm -hmm. And you don't want your enemy to learn something. Yes. From a villain, it is, ooh, ah, this mm -hmm. will inform a future decision. When I say interesting, it's usually, I don't know how to reply to this. <laughs> yep. Yep. I don't know if I should be positive or negative to whatever you said, so I'll just go, interesting, and yeah. then just leave it at that. Pro tip for if you're ever in a Zoom meeting with me. <laughs> Percy is worried that Kronos can tell what happened with the whole small of his back thing, and that is the scariest of the things that he could possibly learn. Kronos tells Percy that he must surrender or Annabeth will die. And Annabeth murmurs, don't, but then Percy yells for Blackjack because he wants to get Annabeth out of there. So wait, real quick, mm -hmm. you're saying Kronos is interesting was about Percy's weak spot. Yes, you think it's about... I think it's about Annabeth. Oh, I, I, think, think, he's be, uh, I think he's realized uh, that his weak spot is Annabeth. Oh, Not his, like oracle weak spot. Yes. Yeah. That's what I that's what yeah, I think he yeah, noticed. Yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. I, because I, we do know because Kronos does know that he's that he's gone in the sticks. Mm -hmm. So we know that. I don't know if we know that at this point, but like we do know that. Mm -hmm. And I think that like the way that like he was scared for Annabeth is what 
Kronos has like locked on. He's like, if I take out Annabeth, I basically take out Percy. That makes sense. And I was thinking that it was one of those two. I guess my comments are more of like, Percy is worried mm. only about the backing yeah. because Percy is very dense when it comes to women. Yep. So I think he is dense in terms of understanding things like Spider-Man breakup type stuff of anyone I love is now in danger by proxy right. sort of thing. Yeah. But yeah, I think you're completely right that yeah. Kronos could be talking about that, could be talking about the back thing. It could be both. Could be both. He could have noticed yeah. like- He's smart. Yeah, he's unfortunately a quick-witted villain. Yep. <laughs> he knows what to do. So at the speed of light, Blackjack swoops in and gets Annabeth out of there. It is so quick that the enemies cannot even react. I like Blackjack not just being cool, fun, comic relief, but also being like a legitimate yeah. asset to the team. I think it's really cool that he is so powerful that the Titans can't even catch up to him. Chrono says, someday soon, I'm going to make Pegasus soup, and I need him to back the hell off and stay away from one of my favorite characters. He says that for now, he will make do with another dead demigod, dead me god, and he slashes with his scythe, Percy blocks it, and a force emits that shakes the entire bridge. Percy yells, kicks his legs out from under him, Kronos' legs, which sends his scythe flying across the pavement. Percy goes in for the stab, but Kronos rolls away and then has his scythe magically returned to his hands. Kronos can tell that Percy's been to the River Styx and is impressed by his courage to do so since he apparently had to pressure Luke in many ways to convince him. And I'm very disappointed here because it's working where the things to make you feel bad about Luke are making me feel bad about Luke because yeah. I'm sure that Kronos did something like say, oh, if you don't do this, I'll kill your mom or whatever. Like, there's going to be some sort of thing where, like, Kronos forced Luke's hand and it wasn't just Luke being like, yeah, this seems okay. Because previously I thought it was Luke just getting in too deep. And I still think that's Luke's fault for yeah. getting in too deep. But it does seem like he got to a point, maybe didn't realize it, and then Kronos yeah. was putting him in positions that were out of his control. Yeah, for sure. Now... Kronos wishes that Percy would have supplied the host body instead because it would have been easier to work with him instead of Luke, I guess. But he pushes that thought aside and tells Percy that it doesn't matter if he swam in sticks because he's got the upper hand as a Titan. And he doesn't just say Titan. He says Titan in all caps and italics. Whoa, Ooh. that's everything except bold. That's almost all of them. He could have underlined it. Ah. <laughs> He slams his scythe on the ground and a force pushes Percy and loads of cars backwards. Even some of the evil demigods are sent flying over the bridge, which feels like poor management from Kronos. Percy sees that the Apollo campers are almost all the way off the bridge, except for Michael Yu, who has one last arrow notched. And I was afraid that this is gonna be another Beckendorf situation where we have a friend who might sacrifice himself for the good of the team. But then Percy yells for him to go. And Michael Yu says that the bridge is weak. Previously, there were mentions of like cracks in the bridge and some of the suspension cables being ruptured by the forces. He's a Jersey tunnel guy. He's like, <laughs> bridges are weak. I like tunnels. <laughs> He's just smack talking the bridge. But he tells Percy to try and break it with his powers. So once he said this, I was like, oh, cool. Maybe Michael Yu is not going to be in trouble. Ha 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 to me in a couple of pages. <laughs> Narrator Percy says, it was a desperate thought. No way would it work, but I stabbed Riptide into the bridge. The magic blade sank into its asphalt. Salt water shot from the crack like I'd hit a geyser. I pulled out my blade and the fissure grew. The bridge shook and began to crumble. Chunks the size of houses fell into the East River. Cronus's demigods cried out in alarm and scrambled backwards. Some were knocked off their feet. Within a few seconds, a 50-foot chasm opened in the Williamsburg Bridge between Cronus and me. Super rad. Uncle Rick is really good at writing action scenes. It's so picturesque. I can vividly see it. It's fantastic. Per suspension bridge with like the missing road stuff and the suspension is just kind of hanging there. Always cool. Always, always cool. cool. They do it in video games. They do it in movies. Mm -hmm. Always looks cool. Mm -hmm. Real bad if it happens in real life. <laughs> yeah. Also real bad if you're playing, what's the bridge simulator game? Did you have to play that one in high school? Oh yeah, to, I like, think it's just called bridge. bridge simulator. Yeah, okay, maybe it is. <laughs> but never good when that happens because yeah, it means you good. lost the level. Percy doesn't feel completely safe, though, as some of these suspension cables are still intact, so he figures the enemies could climb across. And then I wrote, also, Kronos could be magic. And then the next line, narrative Percy says, or maybe Kronos had a magic way to span the gap. Kronos studies the damage, looks around at the rising sun, smiles, gives a mocking salute with the scythe, and says, until this evening, Jackson. And then he mounts his horse and leads his forces back into Brooklyn, where they belong! <laughs> Percy turns to thank Michael Yu, but all he sees is a bow, but no Michael Yu. And I didn't think that this would happen after everything else that took place, so I'm concerned. 
Percy yells in frustration and is about to call for Blackjack to help him search for Muggle U, but then Percy's phone rings, and it's apparently Sally's phone? And I was confused. Was it established that Percy also had a cell phone? Because earlier I thought he told everybody to just call Annabeth if they were in trouble. Didn't someone give him like a burner or something? Like they, they, they exchanged some phones at some point. They picked up a Blackberry from a random lady, and then he explained oh, right. to the other people, hey, pick up phones and then call Annabeth. But I don't think he ever said that he had a phone, and I don't know that he would have told people Sally's number. I don't know, maybe it's just because Selena's one of his close friends that she knows Sally's cell phone number, but like that'd be weird to be like, oh yeah, this is my friend Percy Jackson. I know his mom's cell phone number yeah. by heart. Yeah, sound of Fave 5. <laughs> this was around the time that T-Mobile did like Fave 5, right? Uh, I guess, yeah. yeah. I never had a T-Mobile phone, so well, I didn't It was great, know. unlimited nights and weekends <laughs> for your five favorite friends. Is this on your Sidekick Volume 3 that I did have. Out? I did have a Sidekick Volume 3. Yeah. It ruled. It was the peak <laughs> of technology. Nothing has been better since. No joke. <laughs> The I best just phone. remember they had a commercial with Charles Barkley in it. and Everybody, they, they did, everybody had a side, Snoop Dogg did a sidekick commercial. They would be in rap music videos and stuff. I don't think it was a sidekick three though. What's the um, the Kelly Rowland Nelly song where she- I think that's a chocolate, that's an LG chocolate maybe. Okay, and she's texting- Why do I know this? <laughs> <laughs> Why she, do I know every phone? She's, she's texting someone, but it's micro, oh yay. Get out of here. Respect your elders, don't call us old. <laughs> But she's texting someone using Microsoft Excel on the oh, phone. Oh, yes, so yes. Good. No, that, I almost posited that was a shock. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, Percy Jackson. So uh, <laughs> somehow Selena knows Sally's cell phone number, so calls Percy, and the caller ID says Finkelstein and Associates, so he thinks it's a demigod on a borrowed phone, picks it up, and narrative Percy says, I picked it up, hoping for good news. Of course, I was wrong. It's Selena, and she sounds like she's crying. Not good. The only other time we've seen her cry was when Beckendorf died, so this is not great to start. She tells Percy to come to the Plaza Hotel and to hurry and to bring an Apollo healer because it's dot, 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 it's Annabeth. And I wrote, no, and then in parentheses, I mean, she'll be okay, because I know she's in the sequel series, but no! <laughs> and it's the end of chapter 11, and then we get into chapter 12, Rachel makes a bad deal, and I'm very upset here, because Rachel Elizabeth Dare started off this book amazing, super cute, made me really feel conflicted about how good the love triangle was. Then she's been kind of moody with her painting stuff and being like, grumble, grumble, why does Percy have to save the world? Blah, blah, blah. And then now she's gonna make some sort of bad deal, I don't know, I'm not sure. So all I wrote in the notes here was, Rachel Elizabeth Dare, come on! Is this where it becomes firmly established that we like Annabeth more than Rachel Elizabeth Dare? Does she make some sort of mistake? So that would be my guess, we will just have to see. We are not going to get to it in this episode because I've read half of chapter 12 and I haven't gotten to what the heck this chapter title is, so I don't know. Percy grabs Will Solace. We don't know Will Solace, right? This is a new guy. I don't think so. Cool, yeah. I think he's brand new. So this is our old friend, Will Solace, that we've known and loved across five books so far of the Percy Jackson series. Take Solace and Will Solace. I here. mean, when that was the name for the healer, I was like, okay, Annabeth's gonna be totally fine. Yep. Here, I'm gonna bring along Doctor Everything's Okay <laughs> to see if Annabeth is fine. <laughs> <laughs> so they bring Will Solace from the Apollo cabin and he tells the rest of the campers to look for Michael Yu. Narrator Percy then explains to us that they grab a Yamaha FZI from a sleeping biker and speed towards the Plaza Hotel. Now, I, of course, when I was a teenage boy, was very into cars. Were you very into cars as a teenage boy? Uh, no. Okay. I thought that was, maybe it was just like my group of friends, but we all like knew all the car making models. We were all playing Need for Speed Underground which was a video game that back in the day, uh, but we knew I everything. mean, I did play Need for Speed Underground too, uh, which is uh, one of the best. It's good, it's good. But I never extended into knowing things about motorcycles. Yeah. So like for Percy, not only to be a car teenager, but a motorcycle guy, like that's advanced. Yeah. That's pretty- Now my dad crazy. is in the audience and he was a motorcycle guy. Do we Ooh. want to ask him if this is a good motorcycle? Is this a good motorcycle? Got a thumbs, thumbs up. up. Thumbs up. I mean, thumbs I, up, good motorcycle. I Google image search it. It looks very cool. Yeah, like it's I one bet of those it. intense, like speedy looking, yeah. like semi dirt bike ish, but not a dirt bike. Like this thing looks like it goes very fast. So he's headed towards the Plaza Hotel, which is a very fancy hotel. You may have seen it. It's like right outside of it. Central Park. Yeah. It's super nice. I've never stayed there because it costs like a bajillion dollars, but I have. You also live in the city. <laughs> <laughs> well, before, but I had never stayed there like when you're in New Jersey and stuff. But 
I have used their bathroom, which is very nice. Mm -hmm. and they have a big lobby with like a food court. I was also rejected from using their bathroom once because Johnny and I once during like lockdown COVID times uh, were in Central Park and we had had like some ciders and stuff. We had to go to the bathroom quite bad. And all of the public restrooms in Central Park were shut down, I think because of lockdown stuff. Mm -hmm. So we were like, oh, let's go to the Plaza Hotel. And we had to go like quite badly at this point. Went and then they were like, oh, the hotel shut down because of COVID and stuff. So no use the bathroom. We we're like, oh man. Then there's a movie theater across the street. So we went in there. We we're like, can we use your bathroom? And they're like, it's only for paying customers. And we're like, do you have a merch store or something <laughs> where we can not have to buy a movie ticket? And they were like, yeah, we sell mugs. So we each bought coffee mugs so that we could use the bathroom. They it made was you, that bad. They made you each buy a mug? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> that being said, though, I do have this mug. And now it like makes me laugh every time I open my cabinet. Like, this was uh, the only time in my life where I was like, I might have to pee on the sidewalk. Like, it was, it was, we walked to multiple, and there's not a lot of public restrooms in no. Central Park. We went to, like, multiple, and it was, like, five alarm fire. Like, <laughs> <laughs> I need to do this. So, yeah, now every time I have those mugs, it's like, ah, yes, the time I had to pee. Let me drink some liquids. <laughs> Anyway, Percy Jackson, so they need to go to the Plaza Hotel on this very, very fancy motorcycle. Percy says that he's never driven one before, but it wasn't any harder than riding a Pegasus. And just because you know how to do a harder thing, I don't think it means you know how to do the easier thing. Yeah. Like, I know how to Dougie, but I don't know how to do the boot scoot and boogie. Like, I just don't know the steps. They're different things. It's both dancing, but they're different things. But I was wondering, because of his water abilities, but also really his Poseidon abilities, Poseidon invented horses. So that right. is why Percy is able to ride Pegasi. I wonder if horse powers extends to anything with horse, horse power <laughs> so he can ride a motorcycle. <laughs> It makes sense. <laughs> all right, all right. The other thing is, like, he earlier in this book, he picked up a Vespa. I feel like that's pretty easy, but, like, a sporty motorcycle. I've never ridden a motorcycle. I've ridden, like, yeah. a little scooter-type Vespa thing. It's not that hard. I feel like a motorcycle. I don't even know how I would start the engine. Like, I know stereotypically <laughs> I would go ring, ring on the handle well, because I've seen the music first, video for yeah. Gasolina, but... But also, also an important detail is, like, earlier on, uh, they described, like, how bleak the streets of New York are. There's, like... People are just mm -hmm. passed out mm -hmm. and there's cars everywhere. You would be having to do a lot of swerving, uh -huh. which I don't think he is prepared for that level of obstacle course on this motorcycle. Right, because it's probably heavy and stuff. I don't know. I, I can't yeah. imagine it. But Percy's like, no big deal. I can ride a Pegasus, so I can ride anything. So he does, and he's totally fine. While en route, Percy notices that there are many empty statue plinths, meaning that Plan 23 is working, which is either very good or very bad news, depending on if the statues are good or evil. Does not become clearer in about 30 seconds. <laughs> no, it doesn't, because we meet a statue and it doesn't go well. Nope. <laughs> Narrator Percy says, quote, it only took us five minutes to reach the plaza, an old-fashioned white stone hotel with a gabled blue roof sitting at the southeast corner of Central Park. And Percy likes to make fun of Annabeth for being boring when she talks about architecture, but he knows what a gabled roof is? I don't know what a gabled roof is. I know what it is now because I know what the roof of the Plaza Hotel is. Yeah. But I don't know what a gabled roof yeah. is. He's such a nerd. I love it. He is. He Maybe he's trying to impress her. Oh. Maybe he's like reading some architecture books yeah, in the yeah. summer. He's writing this and he's like, Annabeth's totally going to read my personal memoir. Yeah. <laughs> He admits that the Plaza Hotel is not necessarily the best place for a headquarters since it's not the tallest or the most centrally located building in the city, but it has old school style and has attracted many demigods over the years, such as the Beatles and Alfred Hitchcock, which checks out because they're both very talented groups or individuals, but that's cool. I love the thing in these books where we learn that famous people are actually demigods, and that's fun. I want to know more of this. I kind of get the Beatles, but Hitchcock, like, mm -hmm. I, like, I was a film studies major. Is that what you should be doing with your demigod ability? <laughs> Just, like, directing some of the best films ever? Feels like you could be doing something a bit better with your life. I wonder, and I don't know enough of this, like, I wonder, did he do enough, like, groundbreaking film oh, definitely. technology? So oh, maybe definitely. that's the kind of thing where the yeah. gods are like, oh, no one's done I guess one take of, movies yet? Oh, fine. My kid can do it. Yeah. Yeah, he did Rope. It's a famous one take movie. Oh. It's one shot yeah, through yeah, a train. Right. Yes. Yeah, yeah. 
Okay. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I guess, I guess some of the demigods could have been like the greatest artists of uh-huh. their generation. Sure, 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 so maybe sure. that's where they're getting this from. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Now, Percy does the motorcycle skid from the end of Nope. And he does it by the fountain. Hold on, hold on, hold on. What, 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 the what? end of Nope? Yeah, 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 yeah. It's from Akira. I know, but I don't know what that was. I've seen the movie where they do it, and I don't know what they're referencing. Oh, <laughs> I'm sorry. Beautiful. You, what is it? It's like a Japanese? It's, it's one of the pivotal animes of the 21st century. Got it. I've seen zero. 20th century. Unless Pokemon counts, because I saw. Pokemon counts. Okay, then I saw that noted by the puddle of tears I left in the basement of my childhood home in New Jersey during the Butterfree episode. Ugh. Ooh, that's a rough one. Ugh, one day my heart will heal. He does the motorcycle skid from Akira by the Thank fountain. You. And the statue atop it says, oh, fine. I suppose you want me to watch your bike too. And it's a bronze woman with a bronze sheet around her legs and a basket of bronze fruit. Percy asks if she's supposed to be Demeter. She says that everyone thinks she is, but she's Pompona, the Roman goddess of plenty. I'll have to ask Dr. Moy about this. She gets sassy, saying that no one cares for the minor gods, and if Olympus did, they wouldn't be losing. She praises Morpheus and Hecate, to which Percy replies, watch the bike. She curses in Latin, which I appreciate, and then she throws (laughs) fruit at them while they run towards the hotel. Now, do you think this was... Not stone fruit, like a stone sure, fruit, sure, but sure. like literal, like part of her statue fruit. Or I do think you think so. she's got like some organic fruit she's throwing? No, I think it is from the statue because yeah. I'm pretty sure they said metal fruit. I would right, think right. it's funny if yeah. there was a statue in New York where they had it and then they were like, oh, we got to <laughs> put a fresh crop of fruit in the basket every day. <laughs> yeah. Narrator Percy admits he's never been in the plaza before, but he's wowed by the lobby. It is a super nice lobby. They got big old expensive chandeliers and stuff. And the hunters inside direct them to the elevators, which they take up to the penthouse suites. And demigods have taken over this entire floor, crashing on sofas, using silk curtains to bandage up wounds, raiding the mini bars, the timber wolves are drinking from the toilets, etc. Percy is glad to see that many of his friends are there, but they look rough. Jake Mason rushes up to Percy and starts to tell him about reports of battles that they've received, but Percy just says, later, and then asks where's Annabeth, which is great. Jake tells Percy that she's on the terrace, and he says, she's alive, man, but dot, 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 and then Percy just pushes past him to check on her. Narrative Percy notes that the view from the terrace is gorgeous, but he can't focus on that now given the circumstances. Annabeth is on a lounge chair. She's pale in the face. She's covered in blankets. She's shivering. Selena's wiping sweat off her brow. And then Will and Percy push through. Will opens the bandages, and it's not great. The wound is deep, and the skin around it is green. Percy gets choked up and can only say Annabeth. And... I'm now wondering, hmm, maybe the bad deal that Rachel takes could be a good thing. Maybe she, like, sacrifices herself so that Annabeth will be okay, but we'll see that that probably isn't the case. But I do worry about Rachel Elizabeth Dare making it out of this book. I'm just, I don't know, not fully convinced that she's going to make it out unscathed. I cannot get a beat on her at all. Yeah, like, I yeah. genuinely have no idea what's going to happen with her. It's I do know what the deal is, but I do not know anything past what the deal is. Mm-hmm. It's one of those things where, like, anything could happen, and I'd be like, yeah, yep, that's what happened. And also her name. Her name is suspicious. Why? Because it just, spells the color of her hair? Well, it's just three. I didn't realize that. But uh, <laughs> it's just three names and like Dare being the last name. It just mm-hmm. feels like, I mean, obviously she's important because she's in the book. <laughs> but like, it just feels ominous. Mm. Like, I don't know. I've okay. always gotten a vibe where I'm like, something's going to break bad with her in some way. And I don't know which way. I don't know either. We'll have to see. Annabeth mutters that there was poison on the dagger. And then she says, pretty stupid of me, huh? Not at all. Not at all. What, this is not your fault. Narrative Percy says, Will Solace exhaled with relief. Thank goodness. Will says that a couple more minutes would have been bad news, but the venom hasn't gotten past the shoulder just yet. So it's okay. He requests nectar. And I'm wondering, is demigod med school really easy? It feels like they just kind of pour nectar on stuff. It feels like that's all they do. And I don't know, like, what's the conversation? Like, quick, we need the expertise of Will Solace, the healer. Will, what do we do? Oh, you should put some nectar on it. Oh, we never thought of that. (laughs) So good. But then, much to my demise here, he does do some more stuff. He cleans out the wound with the nectar. Annabeth grips Percy's hand so tightly that it turns purple, but they are holding hands. Will then puts a silver paste over the wound and he hums a hymn to Apollo in ancient Greek. And then he applies fresh bandages. And then he stands up looking exhausted and pale. And Percy figures that, oh, he put a lot of his own energy into Annabeth to heal her. So I've 180'd on med school being easy for demigods. (laughs) I wasn't sure if she was going to make it. I genuinely mm. leading into the shadow, I was like, 
She might bite it. Yeah, I wish I didn't know that she was in the sequel series so yeah. that I would have been more concerned here. Yeah. But yeah, I think that's the power of these books is like, aside from, I mean, I don't know, there's even in book four when Percy was getting like destroyed by the lava attacks, like Uncle Rick does a good job of making it be like, I don't know, it's not looking great, uh, yeah. you know. I do, I and we don't know this, and, uh, at least I don't know this, but like the fact that they mentioned the venom hasn't gotten past the shoulder, they don't say anything about it in this chapter, I don't think, but like, I think it would be cool if she lost her arm and oh. got like a metal arm Whoa. or something. I Annabeth feel, Chase Winter Soldier. Yeah, I <laughs> well, like like it's such a, it's such a like specific thing, and I understand like it's probably like past the shoulder and then into, into the, the heart. heart. Yeah. But like, man, it'd be cool. <laughs> it'd be cool if she just got Robo arm because be she's because cool. she's got all the schematics. <gasps> oh, she's got all the, the schem- stuff. Yeah, from exactly. Dallas. So like, she could make herself an arm, and it would be very cool. Okay, we'll have to reach out to Uncle Rick because if they ever do the thing like when comic books, when they do like alternate reality things, mm. like we could pen that edition. There that could go. be pretty good. Yeah, want to go. see. TM, 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 TM. This is our idea. You can't steal it. <laughs> Even you, Disney. <laughs> you know, they shot Winter Soldier here. They did? Yep. Oh, well, I guess it's cold. <laughs> Boo. <laughs> I don't know much about Cleveland. I'm sorry. I'll learn more as I'm here for the next couple of days. So back to Percy Jackson. Will says that what he's done should do it, but they need to get some mortal supplies. He writes down some stuff on a pad, classic doctor move, and he says that there's a Dwayne Reed nearby around the corner, and Uncle Rick did his homework, because to pick out a Dwayne Reed as the drugstore is so correct, because in New York City, there are Dwayne Reeds, which are just Walgreens under a different name, but Dwayne Reeds are perfect, and at least growing up in New Jersey, they had the best radio jingle. I don't know if they still have it, but they would like have a commercial where they talk about like sales and stuff, and then they would end it with a song where they would go, everywhere you go, Dwayne Reed. (laughs) And it ended on that like minor key of like waiting for it to be resolved and it never got resolved. And I think it was intentional. You're always just like waiting for more. And then where is more? It's at Dwayne Reed. And they are literally everywhere you go. Like every walk in New York somehow has a Dwayne Reed on it. I had never heard of them Mm -hmm. because I'm from here. Yeah. And (laughs) then I went to New York and like, these are literally everywhere and they are great. They're great. They're very good. They're really good. And it's the best slogan of anything ever. Yeah. Everywhere you go, Dwayne Reed. So Uncle Rick, shout out to you for picking the right thing. It would have been weird if he was like, there's a Rite Aid around the corner. There's a CVS pharmacy down the street. Yeah, no way, dude. It's Dwayne Reed. Will about this says that normally he wouldn't condone stealing, but then Travis Stoll interjects saying, I would, (laughs) which is great. (laughs) Will instructs him to leave cash or drachmas behind. He should definitely leave cash behind. If he leaves a drachma behind, what is someone working at Dwayne Reed going to do with that? Absolutely nothing. I mean, they're gold, right? That's probably actually with a lot. I mean, that one cashier who who gets there first is like, (laughs) Good for I'm going to send this to one eight 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 cash for gold. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Call GG when we're 877 cash now. No free ads. So let's move on. So well, we're in Cleveland, so Misney makes them pay. Oh, yeah. Oh, I learned. Oh, that's. <laughs> <laughs> no, when you told me that they have billboards of just a guy's <laughs> eyes, I was like, that's cool. That's really cool. It's literally like the second thing I told Mike driving it from the airport to my house today. <laughs> so good. I love it. I'm so happy. I hope I like see him on the street and I can be like, <laughs> miss me and stare into his eyes. So he's supposed to get a bunch of supplies. He says to get a whole bunch of them because they will eventually need them in the future. Travis calls for everyone to give Annabeth some space while they raid or visit the drugstore. Jake Mason tells Percy as he's leaving that they can talk shop later, but things are under control for now. He's using Annabeth's shield to watch things, and he says that the enemy withdrew at sunrise, but he's not sure why. He adds that they have a lookout at each bridge and tunnel, and then I remembered, oh right, Cronus looked at the sun before he left, and then he said until evening, so something's going on there. He's just dramatic. Yeah, he's just like, oh, I look better in the moonlight, so I gotta go. Like, we ride at dusk. Yeah. <laughs> it's better than just being like, we're going to have a war in the afternoon. That's not fun. Yeah, I mean, skeleton horses in daylight, meh. Skeleton yeah. horses at night, ooh. Yeah. <laughs> Percy thanks him. Jake says, take your time and leaves. And now it's just Percy, Annabeth, and Selena. And I'm thinking, Selena, you got to find a reason to get out of here. And thankfully, she does. She says that this is all her fault. Annabeth asks how that's possible. And Selena says she's never been, quote, any good at camp. And maybe if she was a better fighter, she could have helped. 
narrative to Percy notes that she's been like this, where she's very sad about stuff, and it's only been getting worse ever since Beckendorf's passing. And it infuriates Percy, but in like the positive way of, you know, Selena's so good, I don't want her being so hard on herself. And then as narrator Percy, he states that if he ever discovers who the spy is, he's going to toss them to Mrs. O'Leary as a chew toy. Bleak. <sighs> I know, but also Intense. I'm angry at the spy too. I don't know yeah, who it is. Yeah, of course. I have no idea. Uh, no clue. I don't really think it's Juniper. That's the only guess I've had. I, I have a question. Mm -hmm. Do you, and you might have discussed this. Do you think Beckendorf is definitely dead? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. I, uh, you think he might be coming back? We don't see him die. Yeah, it's true. And that it's always, true. it leaves it open until uh -huh. until we see Finn at the end of that last page. Uh -huh. I'm not convinced. I think he is just because there's been a couple other instances yeah. in the book, like when Tyson died in uh, Sea yeah. of Monsters, like with the big explosion of the boat. I was like, Tyson's going to be totally fine. Come on. Yeah. But I think that trick has been pulled enough where I think I think I, th I, th I think it's very likely, but I also, I'm holding out hope. Just uh, okay. a little bit, Let's, mostly for Selena. That's okay. That's yeah. okay. Okay, but about the spy, I have no clue who it is, and I'm afraid at this point that it's got to be someone that I really like, or at least someone that I don't have negative opinions towards, mm -hmm. and it's just going to crush me, and I'm not looking forward to it. I'm going to be really angry with whoever it is. Percy tells Selina that she is a great camper, she's the best Pegasus rider that they have, and she's great at getting along with people. He says anyone who can make friends with Clarice is gifted, and then I wrote, <gasps> she should talk to Clarice. And then Selena is on the same page as me. She goes, oh, I should talk to Clarice and says that she can convince her to help them. And I think that this is a cool turn. And I wasn't a big fan of the Clarice arc because I thought Clarice was making all this progress towards being a nice person. And then for her to lose all of that by being grumpy over such a silly thing made me very sad. But if the whole purpose of this is to give Selena purpose and make her more impactful, I will feel so much better about this. Percy cautions her that getting out of Manhattan may be tough and convincing Clarice may be even tougher, but Selena insists that she can do this. She asks for a Pegasus because she's supremely confident that she can make it happen. Percy looks to Annabeth. Annabeth gives a slight nod. Percy thinks about it, and though he doesn't like the idea, he thinks that Selena is too distracted to fight anyway, so even if convincing Clarice to join is a long shot, he thinks that this could be the best use of Selena's time and effort, so he gives Selena the go-ahead, she hugs Percy forcefully, and then she pushes back awkwardly and apologizes to Annabeth, which is great. I love yeah. that everyone else at camp knows that they're a thing except for them. Yeah. It's so good. She thanks Percy, promises not to let him down, and leaves. And on this very happy note, we are going to end act one of the show. And this portion of the episode, if you're listening after, we're going to break for the Cash Olympian if you're listening to the podcast. Hey, everyone here, say goodbye to the podcast, people. Bye. Hello, podcast people, and welcome to the Cash Olympian here for some updates and stuff that all go along with the podcast. First and foremost, this episode of TNO is coming out on Monday, August 28th, which means that yesterday, Sunday, August 27th, we had our patron live stream of me and Kelly and Sequoia and Johnny and Steven watching the Lightning Thief movie, and I... I'm recording this little mid-roll break beforehand. I can only wonder what that experience is going to be like, but I'm sure it will be interesting and entertaining. And if you're listening to this episode and you want to watch that stream, you still can if you go to the newsolympian.com slash Patreon because there is a replay that will be available forever. So you can join the Patreon at any time and you'll get access to it. But it not only is a replay of it that you can pause and watch in chunks, you don't have to watch it all in one go, but also there is a live chat replay. So you will be able to see what the comment section was like. So even though it's not live, you still get that live feel. So if you were unable to check it out for whatever reason and you want to, you can still check it out at the newsolympia.com slash Patreon. And you can hear mine and everybody's thoughts about the film since for four of us, it's our first time watching it. And Steven only saw it once when he was 18 and he doesn't really remember a whole heck of a lot from it. So if you want to hear our thoughts about the movies before like November slash December, when the movie episodes of the podcast actually come out, you can go over to Patreon and check that out out. Now, I also wanted to give you the heads up that there is new TNO merch coming. I sent a shipment of stuff over to our merch partner to put up on the store that includes the Pro Pigeon podcast pins and some stickers that we were selling exclusively on tour. And also, we've submitted the design for the camp regular person shirts, and we are working on some TNO beads to celebrate jokes that have been present throughout the podcast as we cover books one through five. So just make sure you're following TNO on social media. We're at News Olympian on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. That's where I will post about stuff 
stuff the second that it's live. And I'll also be mentioning it when the sales and pre-orders and all that kind of stuff is available. I'll mention it here in the mid-roll as well. So just stay tuned. Finally, speaking of staying tuned, we are one month away from our show in Vienna, Virginia, which is in the DC metropolitan area. That show is on Thursday, September 28th. We will be joined by Delia Gallegos as our guest. Very excited for that live show. You can get tickets to that at thenewsolympia.com slash live. And you can also get tickets for the upcoming shows in October, which are going to be in Philly, aka Doylestown, and New York City on October 21st and October 22nd, respectively. Tickets are also live at thenewsolympia.com slash live. And then we are coming to Texas in December, but tickets aren't live quite yet. Stay tuned for announcements when those go live. Now, I talked about the Patreon earlier. A bunch of folks have joined the Patreon in order to watch the stream. I very much appreciate everyone who has joined recently. I appreciate everyone who's ever joined at any point in time or anyone who will join in the future. So many people have joined recently that we have to reinstate the rarely used, but I always am very appreciative when I do get to use this. The I won't thank more than 50 people on an episode because it'll take way too long. So here are 50 of the most recent folks to have joined the Patreon. First, shout out to Meg Roy, who upgraded to the Ultra God Tier status. Shout out to our newest Mega God Tier patron, Hannah McGahey. Shout out to our new Super God Tier patrons. Shout out to our new Super God Tier patrons, Sarah Jane Sellers, Kate Williamson, Child of Apollo number 42, and Harry, did you put your name in the Goblet of Fire? Shout out to our newest God Tier patrons, Tillman, Keith and Monica Wright, Austin Savate, Ashley Givens, Nora, Megan Anderson, Declan Kelm, Fiorella, Bella Gardina, Rhiannon McVie, Jordan Collins, KRS, No to Luke and Seagulls, Emma Holmes, Skylar Sisters, Ali Possum, and Random Hannah. And shout out to our newest demigod tier patrons, Maite Guevara, Jacqueline, Maddie Baisha, Sydney Blumel, Emily D, Amanda Shores, Butterbits, Abby Hood, L, Maria Jew Sims, Del Rowe, Twyla Wilson, Emma from the Land of Chocolate Waffles, Beer and Fries, Hannah Mont, Lily, Carlotta Losada, Sarah McKaig, Bex, Emily McDonald, Mel 3120, Basie, Audrey Ruth, Anna Petrig, Artemis Prime, Samia Cholakova, Sierra, Annika Steiner, and Paras. And a name correction for Rainika Shank. Thank you all so much for your support. May Apollo bless you that if you ever try to toss trash into a trash can or a piece of recycling into a recycling bin, that you make it. Swish! Now, if you're all caught up in the News Olympian and you're looking for new content to consume, I would recommend checking out one of the other podcasts that I make and make a whole bunch of podcasts. I think they're very good. I'm an independent podcast boy, and I think you'd like some of the other shows that I work on. One of the other shows that I work on that I think you would enjoy is Meddling Adults. Meddling Adults is a podcast game show for charity, which I am currently recording episodes for season four, part two where guests compete to solve children's mysteries from classics like Scooby-Doo and Encyclopedia Brown for charity. And we've had a lot of lovely guests on the show so far, lots of wonderful episodes, lots of different detective series have been covered, and there's more stuff coming in the near future. You can listen to Meddling Adults wherever you get your podcasts by searching for Meddling Adults, or you can go to our website, meddlingadults.com. It is fun, it is lighthearted, it is for a good cause, and you can play along at home. Meddling Adults, it's good. Now, before we wrap up here, you're going to hear words from a few sponsors who make it feasible for me to be a full-time podcaster. Some of those ads will be read by me. Others of them won't. The ones that are not read by me are inserted locally. So if you live in Brazil or Portugal, don't be surprised if you hear an ad in Portuguese. But once those ads are complete, we'll get back to this episode of the New Olympian. This episode of TNO is brought to you by Athletic Greens. Now in these chapters, we've got Percy fighting the Minotaur for round two, and he's got to square up with him. He's got to be ready to go. How can he make sure that he's feeling his best? Well, at the start of the day, he could have had some Athletic Greens. I started taking Athletic Greens originally because I was traveling, but now that I am home, I've been taking Athletic Greens in my smoothies, just putting a scoop of it. I put in some kale and some spinach and some frozen fruit and then a banana and then a scoop of Athletic Greens and a little bit of water and boom, I've got a smoothie and it's great. And not only am I getting vitamins and minerals from the ingredients, but also with just that one scoop of Athletic Greens, I'm getting 75 high quality vitamins, minerals, whole food source, superfoods, probiotics, and more. It's really nice. I have had it in water before when I'm traveling. I've had it in my smoothie. I enjoy it both ways and it is lifestyle friendly. So if you eat keto, paleo, vegan, dairy-free, or gluten-free, you are good to go. And it's not just me. Athletic Greens has over 7,000 five-star reviews. So if you want to reclaim your health and arm your immune system with convenient daily nutrition, especially heading into flu and cold season, you can do so with Athletic Greens. To make it easy, Athletic Greens is going to give you a free one-year supply of immune-supporting vitamin D and five free travel packs with your first purchase. All you have to do is visit athleticgreens.com slash newest Olympian. Again, that is athleticgreens.com slash newest Olympian to take ownership over your health and pick up the ultimate daily nutritional insurance. So check out Athletic Greens so you can be ready to go if you need to fight a minotaur on a bridge today. All right, we got time for some Q&A here, so let's do some Q&A. This first question 
is from Danny and Austin. They ask, where'd you get your watch from? We like it a lot. Thank you very much. It is a calculator watch that is pretend gold. It is stainless steel, painted gold. It's a Casio. I think I just got it from Casio's website. You can just buy it online. It's not that expensive. I will never understand why Rolexes cost $10,000 more. In- you know what you can buy with that? A car. Anything. That's way better. You can buy anything. You can buy so Ed many more Ed Sheeran things. owns a $55,000 watch. That's disgusting. Yeah, but he makes so much money. But still, I, I can't imagine yeah. having something that expensive on my person. Yeah. Like, I would be petrified. Yeah. I'd like walk around with my arm, like underneath my armpit to make sure that I didn't scratch it on anything. Terrifying. Not for me. Anyway, this question is from Amber. Amber says, hi, loving the show so far. Drew from Pittsburgh, the superior city. <gasps> and it will, I think there is like a good chunk of people from Pittsburgh in here. So I shouldn't have made fun of Pennsylvania in the first act. My question is about the PJO series. Who would be your top three overall characters from the series to this point? And if you read this book as a teen, do you think you would have the same favorite characters? I think my top three right now are Percy and then Blackjack. (laughs) And then like joking answer would be George and Martha, but I think like actual answer would probably be Tyson. I really like Tyson. He's just such a sweetheart. And I really like his relationship with Percy. I like Tyson a lot. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think he's got a really good attitude at pretty much every moment. Yeah. I like Grover. I like Grover too. I I was choosing between Tyson and Grover. Yeah. And then I probably like Annabeth. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, Percy's fine, Uh but like he's Percy. (laughs) (laughs) He's like the main guy. The main character. Yeah. Yeah. Now, as a teen or as a kid, do you think you'd have the same favorite? I don't think I would have the same appreciation for the Grover and. Tyson types. Yeah, I think sure. I would have more affinity for like the cool people. So I think I would yeah. like Annabeth more because she does more of the cool stuff. I would probably also like Thalia more as well. I think yeah. if I was younger, I still like Thalia a lot. And that's what's hard. All the characters are really cool. Yeah. I just don't think I would have as much love for the sweethearts now that I've softened in my older mm-hmm. age. Do you have, would no, you no, be I, I pretty or? much fully agree with everything you just said. Amazing. Yeah. All right. This one is from Lexi. Hi, Mike. We're loving the show. Since you know so little in Cleveland, thoughts on LeBron James? His high school coach lives on my street. That's pretty cool. It's from Lexi and Maya. Look, LeBron's very good at basketball. He's really solid. I think that you can make the argument that he's the greatest player of all time, and I don't think that it's ridiculous when people are like, no, it has to be Jordan. Like, he's put up a great career. The numbers speak for himself. I think his beard is a little too long, though. I think he looked... has. When he was in the Miami Heat and it was a little shorter and stuff, it looked good. When he got to Cleveland and it got a little too puffy... I don't think it's that good. I also yeah. think like LeBron, just shave it off, man. Just he's, commit. He's, just he's got to commit. Just got to commit. Just commit. The plugs are not doing it. <laughs> they look better of late. Yes. But I just, I don't know, man. Just be okay. Just embrace it. We know what you're going through. Now, Ramona says, hi, Mike. If you had to be possessed by a character from the PJO series, who would you most and least trust to run your life for a day? Least trust either of the Stoll brothers. I don't. <laughs> I don't think that would be oh, very good. Not Kronos. Uh, eh. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that'd be pretty bad too. That would be pretty bad too. But I just feel like the Stoles would like, th- everything would be such a prank. I feel like they would be like really crafty with the identity theft of it all. Like they would like upload a bunch of stuff yeah. uh, onto the podcast feeds and make videos and all this stuff. Like, I don't know, that I, that, that would scare me. Yeah. I Mo- mean, who do you least trust? God. I feel like Clarice would just like jump off a cliff and up someone else's body. Oh no! Just, <laughs> just be like, ah, I'm gonna hurt you. <laughs> oh no! Uh, not like not like you. to a death about, but, but just like to just beat, beat you, you up. up. Yeah. Like like she could beat you up without having to beat you up. <laughs> That's pretty good. Most trust, I feel like either Grover or Tyson. Like they yeah. would just have like a nice. No, probably not Grover. He could eat a bunch of trash, and that would mess up my digestive tract. Yes. Yeah, that's, that's so I would point. probably say Tyson. I think he would yeah. just have like the. You'd most also get nice lost in the day. woods. Yeah. 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 I, yeah. I would just like wake up like under a tree. Yeah. Like, exactly. Where am I? Would you have someone that you would most trust? Probably Tyson. Yeah. Yeah. Seems like a trustworthy guy. Yeah. So this is from Ashley, who also comes from Pittsburgh, but. Ashley identified in the subject line, here from enemy territory, Pittsburgh. (laughs) If you could choose a theme song to play every time Percy goes into battle, what would it be? That's a good question. I feel like I want to give the nod because Percy has only expressed that he likes the White Stripes and hasn't really said any other band that he likes. I feel like Seven Nation Army is a good like hype up entering into battle song. And I think that that would go right up the alley of him. So I feel like that would be a good call for him. Yeah. This is going to be a poll that n- probably no one knows. Uh, someone listening is going to be yeah. like, yeah, yes. in their car. I, I have been playing through the Yakuza games, okay, uh, okay. which are amazing. 
There's a song. I'm pretty sure the song is called ID or ID. I'm not exactly sure. Cool. Uh, it's like during this like escape sequence in Yakuza Zero or maybe Kwame. Uh, it's just really good fight music. Like just All unbelievably right. good. It has like this like chorus that kicks in that like gets you hype. I like it. I like it. Okay, this one, and I think this is a really good one because of the subject line, is Misney is pro-pigeon. If Misney likes pigeons, <laughs> my high praise for him would only be higher. This is from, okay. Andrea. I know, oh, so, okay, I got, okay, it's funny. <laughs> but, but not Andrea, not Andrea or Andrea. No. Oh, man, see, I've already said this on the podcast, but I'm always torn between if it's Andrea mm. or Andrea. And now there's a third one because it's Andrea. Uh, because you did sign this Percy later. Andrea rhymes with mitochondria. And I was like, surely she doesn't mean Andrea. <laughs> but she does. Side. So Andrea <laughs> asks, are there any side characters from the original PJO books that you want to learn more about in the Heroes of Olympus? Also check out West Side Market if you have time. I would love a little bit more Nico stuff because... We've only had Nico like a little bit in book three, mm -hmm. and then he's very much like doing his thing where he's trying to find out about his mom. I would love just like Nico in a more normal like hero type, like along for the quest setting. And I think that that would be really nice to have. So I think that would be my pick. I've like read these books so quickly <laughs> that like it's hard to like think of anybody as like a side character because I've just like plowed through them. But mm -hmm. I'm gonna give I'm gonna give a slightly different answer. I would be interested in learning more about the casino as a place. Oh, because it's the such a Lotus. weird idea that like I feel like you could like set a story about like people coming and going and losing time and doing something interesting with that place. So mm. instead of like a side character, a side place that is like referenced a handful of times. Okay. I like it. I like it. This one is from Dylan. Dylan made the subject line the city that got Donovan Mitchell, because famously it was either the Cavs or the Knicks that were going to trade for them. And the Cavs successfully got Donovan Mitchell. But then they lost to the Knicks in the first round of the playoffs. Um, <laughs> so from the city that defeated Donovan Mitchell, I will give you an answer. Uh, hey, Mike, you've mentioned backyard sports a lot on the podcast, but I've wondered if you have ever played any of Humongous Games' other games, in particular Freddy Fish, since the underworld water setting means references to Poseidon and whatnot, his palace made me think of King Krabs from the first game. I have not played any other humongous games like Pajama Sam or Freddy Fish. Have you? No, I think most of those came out like after my time because uh, I'm a bit older than you even. Yeah, so. They were supremely yeah. in my wheelhouse, but all I did was Backyard Sports and I played all of them and they're all fantastic. And I'm still mad that I don't have my copy of Backyard Hockey. Uh, I don't know where the disc is, but it's the best hockey game I've ever played and I am going to have to try to find an emulator because man, that game is good. Oh, it's good. Okay, uh, we only got time for like a little bit more, so let's see if we can find a good one to end on. Let's see. Okay, someone asked if I would do a podcast about Hades the video game. Uh, I think I'm already doing that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, here's a very interesting question. I'm not sure how to answer this, but let's go. This is from, is it Sanchi yeah. and Sandy? They ask, hi, welcome to Cleveland. Questions. If you had to pick a city to invade, which city would it be, and how would you invade it? Okay. I, I, what's the least populated city? Like, oh. I would just want to go easy street and oh. pick, like, you know, something in Montana and be like, step in, and then, like, put a flag down and be like, yeah. I've done it. Like, I think that would be my invasion tactic. I don't know if this has any logic to it. Okay. But my immediate thought was Salt Lake City. Okay. <laughs> because because for some reason, when, when they got there, the Mormons built, like, a perfect grid. Uh -huh. Which oh. feels easy to invade. Uh -huh. Like Boston is so many curvy streets that you'd immediately get lost and not know which way mm -hmm. you're headed. But yeah. like you could just be like, there, we're going down that way. And it's very straightforward invasion. Yeah. How to do it though, I guess you just have to like airdrop it or something. <laughs> <laughs> I do feel like it would be a bit confusing though, because I don't know if you've ever seen the streets in Salt Lake City, but they are like numbered very boringly, or at least I don't know yeah. if it's Salt Lake, but I have family that live in, you know, a bit like farther north in Utah and the streets are just like East 100 North mm -hmm. and like East 200 North and then like East 100 West. And it's one of those things where it's like, I get that this makes sense, but because it's like so rigid, it gets really confusing. Mm, okay. Cause it's like, is it East 100 North or West 100 South? I know it's direction 100 direction, but what is it? And then apparently like people in the town like call it just like first, second, third, instead of 100, 200, oh, 300. So it's like, then there's colloquial stuff. So it's like a thing that like, it's so simple that it becomes hard. 
everything should just be like New York City where you've just got like streets and avenues and like numbers and numbers. Yeah. Like it's so It's so simple. easy to find your way around. Is yeah. it easy in the land? Is it easy here or is it confusing and just like, you know, just like standard named after it's, stuff? It's easy because if you've lived here, you know which direction the lake is. Uh-huh. Like it's a weird, like it is, <laughs> right though? Like you have a sixth sense. You know that the lake is that way. You just know. You just know it is. Um, so like that's something. I think it's generally pretty easy. Okay. Just because you can only head so far north. Okay. Uh, if, you've, if you've seen the lake, you're like, I know where I am now. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I, th- I don't think, yeah, because we have east and west from, mm-hmm. from Public Square. And then like you just kind of know the main streets downtown. So like it, okay. I feel like it's pretty easy. All right. I feel yeah. like I'm not invading Cleveland because they yeah. would know the directions way better yeah. than me. And I think that is the great note to end on as we all pay homage to the lake, which is over there. But thank you all so much for coming out to the show. Give yourselves a round of applause for making it out to the show. Would not be possible without you. Give it up to Eric for being an incredible guest for both acts. Give it up to all the folks here at Mahal's. Like, everyone has been fantastic. Sound stuff was awesome. Bowling stuff was awesome. Food stuff was awesome. Everything was super duper cool. Very much appreciate it. We are going to head out here. We're just going to clean up our dollar bill related mess uh, and then get on out. But you can still, you know, if you want to get merch on the way out, you can do it. But I very much appreciate you all coming out to the show. And we will close things out in the traditional way until I come back again to the land to do a show because this was wonderful. and We got to make it happen. Got to make a return trip happen. And I'll know where the lake is this time. Until then. (gasps) Thanks so much for coming out, everybody. there. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of The New Stolympian. This podcast is created, hosted, and produced by me, Mike Schubert. I also run the social media and the website. Our editor is Sherry Guo. The music is by Bettina Campamadas and Brandon Grugel, and the art is by Jessica E. Boyd. If you want to be a part of the show's community, you can find us on social media. We're at New Stolympian on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. There's also a subreddit, reddit.com slash r slash The New Stolympian. And then there's also the Discord that you get access to by joining any tier of the Patreon over at thenewstolympian.com slash Patreon. If you want to get some TNO merch, you can go to thenewstolympian.com slash merch. And if you want to support the show, and as a thank you, get access to a whole bunch of bonus content. You can do that at thenewsolympia.com slash Patreon. Speaking of that Patreon, let's give a shout out to our producer level patrons, Kelsey Gillespie, The Damn Steam Nuggets, Vicky Garcia, Ellie Hoskovchova, Veronica Bartova, Haley Hastings, Robin Garcia, Frida Vickstrom, Megan Moon, Craig McRoberts, Taylor Payne, Giselle Salvador, Peter Johnson, The Twins, Sabrina Balsiger, Boney Pony, Casey Williams, Polly Burge, Nikki Harris, Tatiana Schmidt, Sandra Rose, Josh Sayre, Josh Wilkie, Abby Ryan, Wise Girl, Ashton Gabrielson, Marco Redhouse, Caden Max, Sam Sam Reby, Riley Kiddas, Mary Kelly, Audra, Mrs. O'Leary, Rodith Kalna, Milo Kim, Harlan Chris, Cece Reed, 23, Sandkoff, Julia Kendall, Emil Oscar Thomason, Liz Cardigan, Sarah Neal, Ricky, John Drielsma, Rayla Matthews, Riley Draken, Luna Cadoon, Sky Mallory, Elizabeth Obermiller, Aiden Parziani, Biggest Tyson Fan, Hunter Landstrom, Captain Jack Rackham, Sky Captain and the Princess, King Bastion, One Damn Distraction coming up, Ethan Robinson, Ginger Spurs Boy, Joshua Aid, A Cup of Solace, Meg Roy, and Lux. If you want to support the show in a non-monetary way, simply talking about the show is so helpful. Word of mouth is huge. So you can tell someone that you know who loves Percy Jackson about the podcast, or you can talk to someone who's looking for an excuse to finally get into the Percy Jackson books about it or someone who's maybe getting hyped for the TV show that's coming up and they want to understand what's going on or you could post about the show on social media or you could leave us a rating and review on whatever podcasting app you're using. All these things really do help. I'm very appreciative to everyone who has already done so and to anyone who will do so in the future. But I'm just so thankful that you tuned into this episode and I hope you tune into our next episode where we will be joined once again by Eric Schneider, once again live, but this time we will be finishing up chapter 12 and getting into a good chunk of chapter 13. But until then, I'll pursue you later. Hey everyone, how's it going? It's me, Ace Omar Mike. So here in the Shubio, I have a couple of different knickknacks and stuff. And one of the things that I have is a music CD album in the plastic disc jacket and everything. I have it on display because I don't have any sort of device that plays CDs, I think, uh, but it is still nice and uh, a nice possession of mine. And uh, I'm just going to open and go through things just for the ASMR of what, you know, life used to be like for me in the mid 2000s when I actually had a Walkman and stuff. So here's me opening the CD jacket. Here is me uh, taking the disc out, putting it back in. Here is me uh, taking out a little piece of paper. It's a Kim Petras album, and I did a meet and greet with her in order to get the album, so that piece of paper was to uh, verify that I had purchased a wristband. Here is me flipping through the little booklet. And here is me putting everything all back together into the disc jacket. Thank you.
so much for listening.